This is an introduction, or the introduction, to Rubel on Karl Marx, five essays, edited by Joseph O'Malley and Keith Algozin. Maximilien Rubel was born in 1905 in Chernovitz, at that time an Austro-Hungarian city, capital of Bukovina, which passed to Romania in 1918 and to Russia in 1947. He attended secondary schools in Vienna and Chernovitz, receiving a Romanian degree in law in 1928 and a second one in philosophy in 1930. In 1931, he moved to Paris to do German studies at the Sorbonne and received licence et vitre, or I don't know how to fucking speak French, goofy language, there in 1934. Rebel remained in France, supported himself by teaching German and law in private schools, and obtained French citizenship in 1937. The following year, Rubel started a small literary magazine called Verbe Cahier, or I don't even know how to say it, Verbe Cahier Humain, of which just two issues appeared before he was mobilized in 1939 in the Ambulance Corps of the French Army. Following the defeat of France and his demobilization, he returned to Paris and resumed teaching living under the German occupation semi-clandestinely because of his Jewish origins. In these circumstances, in 1941, he was approached by a group of French Marxists in the resistance movement who asked him to translate into German a political text to be distributed in a handbill to the occupying German forces. Rebel agreed, but when he asked to see the text, he was told that it had yet to be written. In the end, although all professed to be Marxists, those charged with composing the text differed so greatly in their interpretations of Marx that they were unable to agree on its formulation. Astonished at this confusion among so many followers of what was claimed to be, quote, scientific, end quote, socialism, Rubel undertook serious study in the literature of Marxism and the writings of Marx. Under difficult circumstances, he located, among other materials, a copy of the Marx Engels Gesamtausgabe, Mega, which had been published in the period of 1927 to 35, and he studied it thoroughly. He was greatly surprised to find that no complete edition of Marx's writings existed, and that not even a complete bibliography of the writings had ever been published. Moreover, he found that the existing biographies of Marx were incomplete and unsatisfactory. One had to compile several of them to begin to get a clear picture of Marx's intellectual life and political activities. He then began composing his own bibliography on file cards as he scourged out and studied additional materials. By the end of the war, after four years of such work, he had reached the paradoxical conclusion that what is called Marxism is actually anterior to the knowledge of Marx. Marxism, Rubel concluded, has only the thinnest of relation to Marx's basic teachings and is in fact a kind of mythification of Marx's person and work. Rubel thus conceived of the need for and initiated a special research discipline with a twofold subject matter. First, Marxist thought in its origin, in its origins and development, considered both intrinsically and in relation to contemporary times, and second, Marxism viewed as a trend of thought that, referring itself to Marx's theoretical and political work, has engendered a multitude of currents in schools, parties and sects, theories and doctrines. He coined the name Marxology as the French equivalent of the German Marx for Schung or Marxismus for Schung. For this discipline, which he considered to be in the tradition of the scholarly periodical, Archive für die Geschichte des Sozialismus und der Arbeiterbewegung published in the years 1910 to 30 under the discretion or the direction of Karl Grunberg and of the research work done by the Russian Marx scholar David Ryazanov before he was dismissed from his functions and sent into exile in 1931 by Stalin. Um, I don't think it says here, but David Ryazanov was eventually executed in the era of the purges. 
After the end of the war, Rubel continued to teach privately and to pursue the kind of research he had been doing since 1941 in view now of presenting a doctor, doctoral thesis. His first publications on Marx appeared in 1946. In 1954, Rubel received a doctorate et lettres from the Sorbonne for two theses on Marx, the principal one being a study of Marx's intellectual development, subsequently published under the title of Karl Marx. Essay de Biographie Intellectuelle. At the, as the title indicates, this work was not intended to be a complete or definitive biography of Marx, something that Rubel believes has yet to be written and would have to be, at the very least, the size of Gustav Meyer's multi-volume biography of Engels. His secondary thesis was an annotated bibliography of Marx's writings, including a list of Engels' writings as well, published in 1956 at, as a bibliographie de ouvre de Karl Marx. Both of these works aimed to fill serious gaps, which, with Rubel's earliest research, had shown to exist, excuse me, which Rubel's earliest research had shown to exist in the body of knowledge about Marx. Indeed, the bibliography, published more than 70 years after Marx's death and long after the establishment of Marxism, represented the first serious effort to inventory Marx's writings in a reasonable manner. Today, more than 20 years later and almost 100 years after Marx's death, it remains the only available catalog of his writings that approaches completeness and can be said to be generally reliable. Together with its supplement, published in 1960, this bibliography has proved to be a most valuable research tool for a generation of specialists and students. While working on his doctorate in 1947, Rubel joined France's Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique, CNRS, taking a post as attaché de recherche, recherche in the Centre d'études sociologiques in Paris. Rubel remained with CNRS ever since. He, has, he was promoted to chargé de recherche, recherche in 1954 and to maître de recherche. Ah, I think it, okay. I think the word is research. That's what I'm going to guess. Rubel retired in 1970 as maître de recherche honoraire. Intermittently since 1950, he has done research in Amsterdam at the International Institute for Social History, depository of the bulk of the original manuscripts of Marx and Engels. Rubel is a longtime member of the French Institute of Social History, the French Institute of Sociology, the International Association of French Language Sociologists, and the French Political Science Association. Among Rubel's teaching activities over two decades, he has conducted advanced seminars and directed doctoral theses at the University of Paris, has been visiting professor at the University of Nice, and at the universities of Munich in Germany, and Aalborg and Copenhagen in Denmark, and he has been visiting fellow in the History of Ideas Unit of the Australian National University in Canberra. He has also lectured at the Karl Marx House in Trier, at the Universities of Aarhus and Roskilde in Denmark, and at Harvard University in the Russian Research Center, the University of California at Berkeley, and Ohio Wesleyan University in the United States. Footnote. The supplement corrected errors and filled gaps that the 1956 publication inevitably contained, given the vicissitudes of the literary remains of both Marx and Engels, the dispersion, dispersal of their libraries, feud amongst literary heirs, 
losses and thefts of manuscripts during the operations that saved the materials from the threat of destruction by the Nazis, etc. The groundbreaking nature of Rubel's work of compilation and the generally unfavorable circumstances in which the work was carried out, especially the inaccessibility of the archives in the possession of the Moscow Institute for Marxism-Leninism, then as now holder of the most complete set of photocopies, as well as some originals of the manuscripts of Marx and Engels. End of footnote. Rubel participated in the First World Congress of Sociology in Washington, D.C. in 1962. The Franco-German Colloquium held in Bochum in 1965. The Symposium on Marx and the Western World at Notre Dame University in 1966. The Conference on the Russian Revolution at Harvard University in 1967. The Conference to Commemorate the 150th Anniversary of the Birth of Friedrich Engels at Wuppertal in 1970 and the Symposium on Varieties of Marxism held at Van Leer Jerusalem Foundation in Israel in 1974. Rubel's list of publications on Marx beginning in 1946 contains over 80 titles, including books, articles, translations, and editions of texts. He remains today as active as ever and is presently preparing an important Marx lexicon, together with his frequent collaborator, Louis... Genovaire, supervising the forthcoming third volume of his French language edition of Marx, about which more will be said, and preparing a forthcoming issue of Etude de Marxologie, one of the series of Cahiers published, Cahier published in the Institut de Sciences Mathematiques, Mathematiques, et Economique appliqué, which is associated with the CNRS and directed by Professor Francois Peru. Rubel has edited the Etude de Marxologie since the founding of the series in 1959. Many of his publications reflect what has been one of the, his principal concerns the lack of a complete and critical edition of Marx's writings. Rubel pointed out the need for such an edition in early articles. He lamented Stalin's purge of the scholar Lee Ryazanov and criticized the subsequent effects of Stalinism. The, quote, abusively political use of Marx's thought, end quote. It's, quote, mummification and falsification, end quote. The, quote, purification, end quote, of certain texts and the suppression of others in inferior editions, prepared by confused and fearful people. Stalinism thus revealed itself as the, quote, absolute negation of all culture, end quote. Rubel's controver footnote. Rubel's controversial paper on Engels' role in the creation of Marxism prepared originally in German for the 1970 Wuppertal Conference and subsequently read in English at the 1974 Symposium in Israel, is included in the present volume as Essay 1. Another footnote. Rubel made these charges of Stalinism being the absolute negation of all culture in La Vie Posthume de Karl Marx, 1948, and Marx, Autor Maudit, and URSS. I don't know how to say those letters in French. As well as other places. For bibliogra bibliographical details of these and all other writings of Rubel to date, see the bibliography of his works included in this volume. Rubel's severe criticism of the Soviet's treatment of Marx's writings provoked predictably hostile responses from representatives of the Moscow Institute for Marxism-Leninism. Rubel's work was branded as, quote, falsifying revisionism, end quote, and he was accused of using, quote, suspect, end quote, quote, anarchist, end quote, quote, anti-Marxist, end quote, and quote, enemy, end quote, sources in preparing his bibliography. See Rubel's forward in the 1960 supplement to his bibliography. On those themes, he found a sympathetic but pessimistic correspondent in Karl Korsch, who wrote, quote, 
The need for a complete edition of Marx's published and unpublished writings has been my preoccupation for the last 30 years, more or less, for the falsification of Marxian thought dates back as far as that, and in other forms began even during the lifetime of Marx and Engels. Perhaps the phenomenon is inevitable in the case of truly revolutionary theory, as in every other kind of religious or quasi-religious movement. I share your profound hope that the present crisis, after having destroyed nearly all the possibilities, will finally give rise to a wider recognition of this need to reconstitute Marx's actual theory in its integrity. But I think that the difficulties are greater than you imagine. First of all, it is impossible in bearing a new revolution in Russia, which is very highly improbable. It will always remain impossible to have access to the Moscow manuscripts, and know better than any and you know better than anyone else the extent to which the 30 volumes of the Russian edition have been cut, mutilated, and falsified. You are also no stranger to the other hundred-odd obstacles which make it impossible to realize the great task, even if the financial means could be found, which is not the case either in the U.S. or in Western Europe. The most that could be accomplished by a select group of nonpartisan Marx scholars would be a critical edition encompassing the original or in translation, all the texts and text variants that are actually available to us today with detailed descriptions of those texts to which we have no access. However, the fact that the majority of the unedited or poorly edited manuscripts remain in Moscow, either in the original or, or the form of photocopies, is a hindrance to such an enterprise and gives the advantage to the falsifying monopolists. Therefore, the situation for restoring the text of Marxism after only one century is worse than it had been for the restoration of Chinese philosophy 2,000 years after the great, quote, burning of the books, end quote, of the Qin dynasty, or worse than for the restoration of the Manichaean dogmas after the total destruction of written documents belonging to this, quote, heresy, end quote. Karl Korsch to Rubel, July 7th, 1951. The problems and obstacles mentioned by Korsh continue to exist today and set limits to what independent scholarship can achieve in publication of Marx. Still, Rubel has persisted in the effort to, quote, reconstitute Marx's actual theory, end quote, if not in its integrity, if not in its integrity, at least as far as possible, by bringing to light and making more widely available essential texts and by providing didactic commentary on them. Two of the earliest publications were selections of texts Taken from thoughts Marx, taken from throughout Marx's writings, presented in translation, French in one case, English in the other, including many first translations, some extracted from unpublished manuscripts. Most of his earliest articles were translations or descriptions of texts that were at the same time that were at the time unavailable or little known. For example, the first French translation of parts of Marx's 1844 Paris manuscripts and the descriptions of Marx's Grundrisse of 1857 to 8, and of his research notebooks from eight, the 1840s and 1850s. These were extremely valuable contributions at the time, and some of them still have not been supplanted by subsequent scholarship. Since the series' inception in 1959, the Etude de Marxologie has been Rubel's principal vehicle for these kinds of contributions and for communicating a mass of valuable bibliographical information. It has also been a form for text editions, interpretive studies of text, and historical essays by a number of independent scholars, including, all right, here's a bunch of names, so I hope you're ready for uh, some butcher, butchery. Um, Miguel Abensur, who I think wrote that book, uh, Democracy Against the State. I mean, he's like a French radical democracy guy. Bert Andreas. Shlomo Avineri, who's written some important books, I'm pretty sure. Siegfried Bana. Van Bordet. Olivier Corpe. Hal Draper, and we wrote the five uh, volumes, uh, Karl Marx's Theory of Revolution, I think is the title, but it might be something more exact than that. Lloyd Easton, Louis 
Genover, Margaret Manal, Paul Maddock, yeah baby, Henry Meyer, Neil McKinnis, Marion Sauer, Fred E. Schrader, and I think it's like a Hegel scholar who also is a Marx, has published some commentaries on Marx, Janine Verdes, Mark Villemier, and others. Look, we got through that almost painlessly, even though I probably fucked up every name that had, that was French and not German, and then probably the German ones too. There have been disappointments. In the early 1970s, for example, in anticipation of the 1983 centennial of Marx's death, Rubel tried to stimulate formation of an international editorial board of nonpartisan Marx scholars that would produce a historical and critical and of necessity partial jubilee edition of Marx. The Moscow Institute of Marxism-Leninism, however, had already announced a renewed effort to produce a full marx engels Gesamtausgabe, a new mega in more than 100 volumes, and in collaboration with the Institute for Marxism-Leninism in East Berlin, and published a sample volume, 1972, exemplifying the features of the projected edition. Rebel's efforts encountered a lack of support, owing in large part to the opinion held by certain Western scholars that his project was essentially the negative one of a, quote, anti mega end quote, a judgment that completely neglected both the positive features of all of Rubel's previous work and also the advantages of the kind of historical and critical edition he was proposing. Footnote. At this writing, Rubel is still attempting to organize production of a centennial edition. He envisages an edition of 35 volumes of 600 to 800 pages each and having a number of remarkable features. For example, Marx's writings would be presented in three sections or series in accord with the methodological criteria of the author's threefold critique, the critique of ideology, the critique of politics, the critique of political economy. Each volume would contain, along with appropriate main works of Marx, the correspondence, source materials, contemporary documents bearing on the, those works, the presentation of texts while respecting the regular canons of scholarly editing, would be designed not for the specialists, not for specialists, as in the case of the ongoing critical edition of Hegel, but for the broader category of readers and researchers whom Marx aimed to reach. Recently, after agreeing to undertake publication, a Swiss publisher had to abandon the project because of the production costs. Rubel is now proposing the constitution of an international society of scholars and other interested persons, the principal purpose of which would be the realization of the Marx Jubilee edition. End footnote. Rebel's efforts to produce critical editions of Marx's texts have been crowned by a superb French edition of Marx, published in Paris by Gaimard in the Bibliothèque de la Pléiade. To date, two massive volumes of Marx's economic texts have been published and gone through several editions. A third volume devoted to Marx's philosophic and critical essays of 1838-46 to is now in press and due to appear in the near future. The first volume of economic text is composed of writing published during Marx's lifetime and features the first truly critical French edition of Book I of Capital. The second volume, about which more will be said, contains text that Marx left unpublished and that Rubel has selected and arranged in keeping with his own con concept of the structure and contents of Marx's broader, quote, critique of political economy, end quote. Rubel considers this a pilot edition to serve serious students as well as specialists pending eventual publication of all of Marx's manuscripts. At the same time, in its introductory material, notes, appendices, and critical apparatus, in its overall presentation of text and in its overall concept, it is a great scholarly achievement and, as it most, and as, it, as its most serious reviewer has pointed out, a work of historical importance. Quote, It can henceforth be said that if someday a complete edition of Marx's materials is realized, Rubel, who proceeds in a way similar to Ryazanov, will have marked with his, editor his editorial work an important intermediary stage, and this stage is all the more important in that it reveals an unknown Marx, end quote. Miguel Abensoa. 
the quote unknown Marx, end quote, who is revealed in Rubel's edition and throughout his other writings is almost the exact opposite of the mythic figure found in popular consciousness in Marxist orthodoxy. He is a thinker whose doctrines combine utopian ethics and social science, a writer whose literary remains are but fragments of the masterwork he projected, and a political man who neither founded nor wished to found any system, party, or movement, yet he was a man whose view of things, for all of its peculiarities, remains a unique value, of unique value today, and therefore must be permanently disengaged from the distortions of Marxist and anti-Marxist mythology. In the balance of this introduction, we will briefly treat these points in Rubel's interpretation of Marx. Ethics and Science For Rubel, for Rubel Marx's doctrines contain both utopian ethical and rigorous scientific elements. The ethical element is comprised of a vision and a demand, the socialist utopian vision of a universally human community, and the demand, formulated as a Kantian categorical imperative, that it be realized. The scientific element, on the other hand, is a descriptive and analytic account of the modern system of economy in its social and political structures. This account takes the form of a critique of the, quote, science of modern society, end quote, political economy, and it shows modern society to be in the process of destroying itself while simultaneously generating the material and spiritual prerequisites for the kind of society envisaged by the utopians. In Marx, therefore, as Rubel, Rubel understands him, an ethical impulse motivates the scientific endeavor, and the scientific results support an ethical vision. The critique of political economy demonstrates the historical variability of the utopian ideal, quoting Rubel. Quote, Ethics does not constitute the basis of the Marxian theory. Rather, socialist ethics, which is interior to Marx, received scientific reinforcement in the theoretical teachings of the author of Capital. Marx preserved the substance of the ethical demand for the socialist utopia in order to put it into a sociological account of the capitalist relations of production, an account he referred to rather modestly as a, quote, scientific conception of social conditions, end quote. Letter to Ferdinand LaSalle. It is a science of the coming to be and passing away of a mode of man's exploration, ex it is a science of the coming to be and passing away of a mode of man's exploitation by man, and it is the utopia of a universally human community, willed and realized by the class comprised of the most numerous and most poor, to whom Marx attributed the consciousness of this emancipatory mission. While insisting on this dual character of Marx's thought, at once descriptive and, and visionary, Combining a theory of realized history with the image and project of a history to be constructed, Rubel stresses the utopian ethical over the rational scientific side of Marx's doctrines. In opposition to the view of Marx as a founder of a system of thought and a unique scientific Weltanschauung, Rubel's interpretation tends to underline the emancipatory aim behind Marx's teachings, highlighting the stimulating ambiguities and frequent invectives that are so little in conformity with the strictly scientific spirit attributed to Marx in Marx's literature. After reading Rubel's Karl Marx, Paget Choisse, Choisi pour un éthique socialiste, 1948, Karl Korsch endorsed Rubel's stress on the utopian ethical side of Marx, which Korsch, Korsch took as equivalent to making, quote, social praxis rather than science or theoretical dogma, end quote, the heart of Marx's message. message. For Miguel Abensur, the same stress on the ethical utopian over the scientific aspect of Marx's thought is reflected in Rubel's Pleiad edition of Marx, and the edition, according to Abensur, represents a conception of Marx's thought as essentially Zukunftsht theory. theory. No. Zukunftsht <laughs> theory.
I don't know if that's actually how you say any of that shit. No. But and I'm sorry for subjecting you to my terrible translations, but or uh, not translations, uh, pronunciations. Uh, but you have to deal with it. That is a quote theory of the future, which is animated by the vision of a classless society and has as its project a workers' socialist revolution and the building by the proletariat of a new world, end quote. According, referring to the Palliade edition, and specifically to Rubel's introduction to volume two of Marx's economic text, Louis Dumont writes, quote, Maximilien Rubel, or Maximilien Rubel, stresses forcefully what he calls the ethical conviction of Marx's initial stand and sees in it the great shaping force that determined the general outline of Marx's thought forever afterward. The fact is so obvious that it is hard to understand that Rubel's thesis is not universally admitted, end quote. What prevents some from admitting Rubel's thesis is their insistence in the face of the textual evidence on dividing Marx's intellectual life into pre-scientific or non-scientific and scientific periods in the fashion of Louis Althusser. Others unlikely to accept Rubel's thesis are those holding narrower conceptions of science and ethics who tend to consider the two incompatible, and those who, perhaps uncomfortable with the idea of ethics or that of utopia, want to locate the value of Marx's doctrines exclusively in their scientific character. Those who stress the scientific side of Marx, however, usually ignore or deny what for Rubel is a demonstrable matter of fact. Marx's projected scientific work went largely unwritten. The economics, or excuse me, the quote economics, end quote. Marx intended to write a six-part critique of political economy, but this work, which he referred to as his, quote, economics, end quote, remained at his death largely unwritten. The work was to have been elaborated according to a plan that Marx formulated and denounced in the period of 1857-9, to 9, and that he neither abandoned nor significantly altered thereafter. Of the projected six parts, Marx himself completed and published only a portion of the first, which we know today as Book One of Capital, leaving at his death a mass of more or less rough manuscripts and raw research data. Engels, and subsequently Karl Kautsky, produced out of these materials and the remaining parts of Capital. Engels editing books two and three, and Kautsky editing book four, quote, theories of surplus value, end quote. The common view, which is also the view propagated by orthodox Marxism, the capital sets forth Marx's full political economic doctrine is wrong on two counts. First, capital even taken altogether in its four books is not equivalent to what Marx projected as his, quote, economics, end quote, but only its first part. And second, books two and three of capital in the form we have them as edited by Engels are not really finished treaties or treatises as Engels let them appear to be, but rather are an assemblage of Marx's more or less raw materials selected and arranged at times arbitrarily by Engels. Hence, there is a much less finished character about Marx's theoretical work in political economy than is ordinarily supposed or than orthodox Marxism pretends. This set of twofold, sets a twofold task for an editor of Marx who wishes to remain true to the author's intentions and concept of his work. First, instead of being presented as a self-sufficient work, Capital must be published together with other texts that Marx considered to be closely related to his, quote, economics, end quote. Most of these texts, most of these are texts that Marx left unpublished, and some of them, including the very important Grundrisse of 1857 to 8, Engels seems to have been unaware of. Second, books two and three of Capital have to be redone with critical scrutiny of Engels' choice of materials and in such a way as to eliminate the false final, the false finished appearance of Engels' version. This is what Rubel has done in the first two volumes of his Pleiad, Pleiad edition. The second volume of which is especially controversial. 
There, Rubel has selected and arranged Marx's draft manuscripts for books two and three of Capital differently than Engels did, one result being that Rubel's edition includes text published nowhere else. Moreover, Rubel includes Marx's first draft of a critique of political economy written in Paris in 1844, the so-called economic and philosophic manuscripts, among the preliminary draft materials for the, quote, economics, end quote, in effect, again, rejecting the thesis of a, quote, break, end quote, between Marx's early and mature thought, and he freely selects and rearranges material from the Grundrisse so as to reflect Marx's ground plan for his, quote, economics, end quote. These are controversial steps and kind of a dare. These are controversial steps, the kind of daring moves that can be taken with success only by an editor who is profoundly in touch with his author's thought and intentions and also thoroughly familiar with the mass of relevant manuscripts. For Rubel, there is more at stake here than a mere choice between possible arrangements of Marx's text. Rather, it is a matter of fundamentally different conceptions of the character of Marx's doctrines and his way of thinking. Capital, in Rubel's view, is a work that is not only unfinished, but amendable. Marx's manuscripts for the unfinished books two and three are more often attempts at critical reasoning and preliminary conclusions than ironclad and apodictic constructions. Furthermore, Marx's broader plan for his, quote, economics, end quote, indicates not a rigid system, but a pattern of thought open to corrections and extensions. In sum, instead of the, mono the monolithic Marx, with a closed, perfected, and axiomatic system, Rubel proposed a living Marx whose doctrines are open, unfinished, and faithful to the author's critical spirit." End quote. Marx and Marxism. Marx, as Rubel presents him, propounded neither a philosophy of history nor a scientific Weltanschauung. Moreover, Marx founded no party, school, or movement of either an ideological or political nature. What Marx's self styled followers have elevated into a supposedly scientific Weltanschauung, his quote, materialist conception of history, end quote, was for him merely a quote, guideline, end quote, for research and study. The pretense of Marxism to be a scientific theory and unique interpretation of human history based on the words and works of a prophet is therefore false. So too is the pretense of the quote Marxist end quote states to embody the realization of Marx's social message. Their revolutions could not have been either proletarian or socialist because they resulted in the creation of proletarian masses and state capitalist production relations. Quote, Moreover, they could find in Marx's writings no political recipe intended for statesmen desirous of, quote, making a revolution, end quote, end quote. Both in its theoretical claims and its political practices, Marxism mystifies facts, propounds, and feeds on mythology. And that mythology, moreover, is shared and promoted by most species of anti-Marxism, as, for example, that of France's Nouveau Philos Philosophes. Uh, the New Philosophers, which I think is like a, uh, like kind of like a conservative uh, philosophical current that like gained prominence in the early '80s, but I can't be sure. I don't know. I don't know why I'm even pretending to talk about it. I think some. Left people kind of fuck with one guy from that, uh, this group, uh, Pascal Bruckner, for criticizing, like, uh, the left's abandonment of its, uh, universalist values when it comes to, uh, repressive and reactionary politics emanating from, uh, the so called non West. Um, for example, being soft on or s even actually sympathetic to uh, Islamism <coughs> as a uh, supposed revolt against uh, modernity that's somehow emancipatory but is not. Anyway, I don't know why. Sorry, it's late in the night. Quote, 
This is from France's Nouveau Philosophe. Marx, who's, quote, Marx, who set out to show the force of fate in the development of human history and so the lack of control and responsibility on the part of the individual subjected to the, quote, productive forces, end quote, a concept he extended also to the actions of social classes. This Marx has had foisted onto him the role of a superman capable of giving birth to revolutions and terrors, empires, and inquisitions. The fact that Marx himself renounced philosophy in favor of scientific research into the matter of social evolution did not forearm him against the excessive judgments of those pseudo-philosophers who, fanatical, quote, Marxist, end quote, only yesterday, now try to shift the blame for their own misfortunes onto Marx. The very thinker, whose entire effort was to denounce and frustrate the play and triumph of unbridled ideology, of all the intellectual fashions that have appeared in France since the imaginative liberation of May 1968, the most recent one, foolishly baptized as the, quote, new philosophy, end quote, is incontestably the most stupefying. The ignorance it displays in attacking Marx is matched only by the impudence with which it rejects today the Marxism that only yesterday it accepted and venerated as the truth of salvation, end quote. Okay, that's not actually, that was not uh, France's Nouveau Philosophes. I thought it was a quote from them, but I guess that's from uh, Avant Propos to Etude de Marxology, uh, January, February, 1978. Sorry for any confusion. For Rubel, establishing the truth about Marx and Marxism is more than a matter of historical and scholarly accuracy. It is a matter of freeing ourselves from a potentially fatal misunderstanding of the forces at work in our contemporary world. Quote, the regimes of false socialism are no less inhuman than are those of true capitalism. These apparently antagonistic systems of government are in reality accomplices in one and the same enterprise of man's material destruction and moral debasement, end quote. Expanding on this starting conception, excuse me, expanding on this startling conception, Rubel indicates why in his view the study of Marx is important and also what he sees to be at stake in the ideological, economic, and political strife of our time. For what the following text says about these things, and for what it tells us about Rubel himself, it is an appropriate quote with which to conclude this introduction, quote, out of the conflict between the machine and man, between profit economy and general interest, between state and society, there progressively emerged a revolutionary teaching and social theory that founded Marx a most convincing spokesman. His teaching constitutes, in fact, the most coherent critical theory of the crisis that grips the modern world, and as such it is the negation of all political ideologies and so also of Marxism in all its varieties, whether revolutionary or reformist. According to this theory, the present crisis represents a necessary stage in the transition of the capitalist mode of production towards a human community free of commodities, money, and state, a society in which the economic and political forms of human alienation are unknown. This era of transition is the era of the bourgeois creating man, the, excuse me, this era of transition is the era of the bourgeoisie creating man in the bourgeois image, a mutilated being serving capital in the state. The historic mission of the bourgeoisie is to develop the productive forces, both material and intellectual, through science and technology. This being the case, the contemporary regimes that call themselves socialist or communist and that have only recently attained a level of modern civilization, in fact, fill the same historic function which the bourgeoisie filled in the Western nation states. They developed a system of state capitalism that combines the traits of the most advanced industrialism with the characteristics of the most inhuman political absolutism. The bourgeois nature of these, quote, Marxist, end quote, regimes is fully revealed in the priority they give to the development of their industries of death, the material arm of the military totalitarianism they practice, and cultivate with the aim of maintaining the balance of terror between themselves and the powers of the so-called, quote, free, end quote, world. A balance of terror which is the condito sin qua non for imposing by terror the economic and social status quo that assures their own privileges as the dominant minorities. 
As an authoritarian ideology, Marxism particularly, in its social democratic, Leninist, and Maoist versions, is an accomplice to the system of political and economic domination that threatens to plunge our human societies into a new world cataclysm. In other words, this Marxism is one of the things, and not the least dangerous one, that help keep the exploited and dominated masses of mankind in a permanent state of intellectual and moral resignation, end quote. We have been able here only to touch on some facets of Rubel's work. That will have been enough, however, if by now the reader suspects that Rubel is special among Marx commentators, and so is stimulated to study the essays that follow with an open and critical mind, and with the expectation of gaining new knowledge. Such a reader will not be disappointed. <laughs>